Yes, the topic of these lectures uh, is about is particle methods for optimization of our measures. And there are many examples which fall into this framework, but I will stick to one uh, uh, example most of the, for most of the lectures, which is the example of two layer neural networks, just to avoid switching topics or switching uh, notations too often. Uh, but I will mention also a, a variety of applications. So the general problem is as follows. Uh, we have X, uh, let's say a D-dimensional space. So this could be R to the D, the D torus or the D sphere, uh, a Riemannian manifold. And we have a functional F defined on the space, let's say to start of probability measures on X, which takes values in R and we which will assume to be convex. Convex in the usual sense. And we, our goal is to solve, yes. Ah, I have to write bigger, okay. So you, you can, uh, yes, even on that side. Okay. We want to solve the following problem, minimize over the set of probability measure, a function f of nu. Is the size okay? Okay. I wonder how my big equations will fit uh, later with this size, but okay. So that's the general problem of convex optimization. So here I've restricted to probability measures, but later we will see that the methods I discussed they generalize to non-negative measures uh, of finite mass or general uh, finite uh, signed measures. And uh, the type of algorithm we'll consider are particle gradient methods. So the idea of uh, particle methods. is As follows, so we write our probability measure mu as a sum of weighted Dirac masses. I have to choose a number of particles, which I will call M. And I, they have weights AJ and position XJ. So XJ is uh, the parameters or uh, theta, all the AJ and XJ, which lives in R plus because uh, here we represent a probability measure, or plus times uh, or only on space X to the power M. So this is our parameter space. And then we do gradient methods on theta. So uh, the algorithm is initialize theta zero, and then you uh, make an update at step K. Okay, let's call it zero like that at step k the new update is given by theta k minus some gradient update this will be the gradient of the function fm of theta where fm of theta is the function f of mu theta okay so i have my special probability measures that i parameterize in a certain way this defines a new function. I keep the M as an index. Keep in mind that this is the finite dimensional version of the problem. And I update with a gradient. Uh, typically we have a choice of step size. And we will see also that we need some uh, preconditioning. So P of theta, uh, which will be a preconditioning. And we'll also add some noise which sometimes will be useful for the algorithm. And sometimes this update will take us outside of the constraint set. So we need a projection. Ah, I have to write below, okay. Okay, I see. More and more the space on the blackboard shrinks. <laughs> I will write here, very big, it will work. So that's uh, the kind of algorithm we look at. And what we are expecting from the theory is to understand uh, how they behave. What is the choice of this preconditioner that we will choose? So we will somehow modify the gradient because it's not the best to took the Euclidean gradient of this parameter theta. 
Uh, what is the role of this noise? So that will be the object of the second lecture, the convergence guarantees of such algorithm with noise. And uh, we want to understand in which case we can expect to have global convergence because of uh, the, the main problem here is that FM, main problem, FM is non-convex. So although we started with a functional F, which was convex or, or on our infinite dimensional space of probability measure, to make it tractable, we make it finite dimensional. There are other ways to do in these lectures that will only talk about particle methods. But by doing so here, we have lost uh, convexity. So did we lose everything or not? This is something we try to understand. Uh, yeah. Yes, we want to. So that will be the object of, in fact, this first uh, uh, session. I will discuss how many particles are needed somehow to uh, approximate a, uh, an infinite dynamic. Uh, I will discuss that. So that was the introduction. And the example we will keep in mind will be the example of a two layer neural network. So this was the introduction. So let's consider two layer neural network. So the motivation is that these neural networks, although they are not formulated as optimization over the space of priority measures uh, as such, they can be reformulated as, uh, as a problem in this class. And when you do a standard uh, backpropagation algorithm, when you train a neural network, it turns out that it does an interesting algorithm when interpreted in the space of probability measure. So it will be a nice way to introduce these algorithms, uh, although the algorithms we'll end up having can be applied to other problems. Yes? This one? Yeah. OK. Uh, so I will start with the first question, which is to uh, explain a bit more this algorithm. So we have. So, so far, it's all abstract because I did not present a, a particular problem. But new is a priority measure. It's infinite dimensional. So we need, if we want to implement it in a computer, we need a finite dimensional representation. We will choose to represent it as a sum of uh, Dirac masses with weight AJ, AJ and XJ. And uh, of course, this does not cover the whole space of probability measures, but we hope that we are not too far away from uh, solving our problem with such a representation. This depends on the problem. And now our goal is to select the good parameters theta. So theta is the vector that, that contains all these uh, parameters. Uh, and to find theta, we'll use a gradient descent algorithm. But then I have added some refinements because these are the ones we will need. The basic idea is that you take theta zero some initialization, uh, which I will discuss. And then each update will be uh, the previous update minus a quantity proportional to uh, the gradient. Sometimes we modify a bit the gradient to have a good algorithm. And we can also add some noise. But this is also optional. And why is FM non-convex? Uh, this will become clear in the example of neural networks. Uh, why we use, use linearity, uh, convexity. The main thing is that, uh, like the main remark is that FM will be convex in the parameters AJ because here this is the linear parameterization. Uh, mu is linear in the AJ. However, the, it's not linear in the XJ and this is where we lose the convexity when we start moving the position of the edge. So a neural network uh, of width M so I choose the width of my neural network, some uh, integer. And uh, I define HM. This will be a prediction function. So the goal, uh, we will uh, study neural networks in the context of supervised learning. The goal is given some input and output data to find a function which uh, maps the input to the output. So X is my input here. And I want a function H, so sorry, I will not call it HM, I will call it H theta, because it will be parameterized by a vector theta, which is of the form uh, 1 over M sum for J equals 1 to M of uh, phi of W J X. So it's a sum of functions of X, which are parameterized by W J, where uh, I, I shouldn't write here. 
So where uh, <coughs> phi of wjx, this is usually a function of the form aj sigma bj transpose x. So here, uh, bj is a vector. So aj bj is a vector in R times R d. X is my input, but j is one parameter. These are called the input weights. Sigma is a nonlinearity. It's just any nonlinear function from R to R. Then I have the output weight, aj, which is a real number. So each of these functions, phi, is parameterized by a vector which I call wj. wj to recall the name weights, which we usually use for neural networks. Which is a vector in R to the d plus one. And since I have m such functions, the set of parameters is a vector in R to the d plus one to the m. So this is what is a two layer neural network. This is a specific way to write it. Which is a lot because we have only two layers. We cannot really write uh, deeper neural networks as sum, but we use uh, this structure a lot. So, a sum of simple functions. And then uh, you, we usually do to find the good parameters theta, which will allow us to solve our supervised learning task, to predict the good output given a simple uh, given input. We take a training set uh, xi, yi. So A uh, data points, which will be in Rd times, let's say, R to the power N. And we do empirical risk minimization, which is you minimize uh, over your parameters theta, the function which I will call Fm of theta, which is the empirical risk of the predictor H theta. What is it? This is the average error that we make uh, on our training set, the average error of prediction on our training set. So we have this functional where L uh, is a loss and is assumed convex and smooth in second argument. This is a typical uh, assumption. So L, you can think of it as just the square distance between uh, yi and the prediction, and you want to penalize the fact to do uh, wrong predictions on uh, your training set. And hopefully, when you uh, find the, the theta that solves this problem, uh, you are uh, happy and you hope that when you'll see new data, you'll get a good predictor. So, in general, this is not the case. And if you want to have more guarantees, typically you had some uh, so called weight decay regularization to control somehow the, the, the kind of predictors that you will find. So all of the theory we discuss covers the case where you had some regularization, but to simplify notations, I will not carry it. And we'll just consider such a function. So L is a loss, uh, convex and smooth uh, in its second argument. Okay, so that's the basic problem of uh, training a two-layer neural network. And the basic algorithm which is used is uh, gradient descent. So in practice, we often use mini batch stochastic gradient descent, but again, we'll simplify things. Yes? A quick question on the problem set of a two-layer neural network. Now you took it as an expectation over some measure of the weights, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, is it possible to take it as one over root M or some other scaling where it can't be seen Here as or a... there? D here? There, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll comment on the scaling briefly. Uh, okay. yeah. Yes? Uh, so, so this was just presenting the general problem we are going to discuss. Now, X, in fact, will be R to the D plus one with the usual Euclidean structure. So now we are in this concrete setting and we'll only come back from time to time to the more general case when. We'll see how our algorithms can apply to other things.
Oh, so now the question is, if we have a metric on X, what is this assumption of convexity natural? So geodesic convexity is in general, so the, the, the good way answer. So the question is, why do I make this convexity assumption rather than geodesic convexity? Uh, so you need to define a notion of a metric on P of X, which is not immediate, if, even if you have a metric on X. But you can still, uh, I mean, there's the notion of displacement convexity, which is very demanding. In fact, uh, convexity is much more common in applications than geodesic convexity. So that will be my quick explanation of why I make this assumption. In the end, it's because it allows for a natural theory which covers a large number of examples. When you have geodesic convexity in some sense, everything becomes much more uh, tractable and uh, But this abstract setting was just to present the problem. Now we'll discuss this particular case of neural networks. And so when we train a neural network, I will consider the, the most simple version of uh, backpropagation algorithm, which is particle gradient descent. You take, you initialize theta zero, uh, which are this, uh, all this family of weights, W1, 0, Wm, 0, by following, uh, by sampling from some distribution mu0 in the space of probability measures over d plus 1. Okay, so all the neurons, all the parameters of each neuron, so this you can interpret as a neuron, are sampled independently from some distribution. And then you do gradient descent, which is theta a plus one equals theta k minus the gradient of fm at theta k. Um, here, I will add a step size and also a scaling m, which will be needed in what follows. And I will also add a noise just for the sake of generality because it's possible to do. So I can add uh, zk where all the zks are. Uh, normal uh, random vectors, so Gaussian random vectors. I can add some noise to my gradient at each step. It's not clear why I would do that right now, but we will see by the, the, the theory that this is useful. And we will be both interested in the case when tau equals zero, so the noiseless case. I will cover it in the last lecture. And the case where tau is larger than zero, so the noisy case, which I will cover in the next lecture. Uh, and also to simplify things a bit, just for the sake of the presentation, I will consider the continuous time version of this algorithm. This is not needed per se for the, per se for the theory. This is just because derivations become slightly uh, simpler. So the continuous time version I will call it particle gradient flow, so GF or gradient flow. And in fact, I should add a noisy because I have added some noise, which is not part of the problem. Um, so this is the same initialization, but now I have a continuous time index, which I will call T. And uh, the update, the small variation of theta time T will be given by, so here this corresponds to take eta, the step size, to zero, and here I chose the correct scaling. If you have already seen the time discretization of SDEs, this is uh, how it works. When eta will go to zero, after appropriate time risk scaling, I will converge uh, in a weak sense to some uh, solution of the following SDE, which is minus M gradient of theta at time T. So this is the usual gradient flow, and then, because of our noise, we will add some Brownian motion, uh, which is a standard Brownian motion. So that's the dynamic we will be interested, uh, interested in. And now what I want to do is two steps. First, I want to reformulate this dynamics as a dynamics in the space of probability measures. This is useful for two facts. 
First, because here you see that there is an invariance by permutation on the uh, WJ. I can permute uh, the weights and I recover the same problem. The representation as a vector of theta does not capture this invariance. And also, it's not very natural to fix M. I have a prediction task. I do not know how many neurons are needed to actually solve it. We would like to have a representation which is independent of M. So these two invariances will be captured by the following reformulation in the space of quality measures. Uh, so, I will reformulate these dynamics as a dynamics in the space of quality measures. And the way we will do is by defining new hat of T, the empirical measure made of all these uh, particles WJ at time T. Okay. So this is the particles associated to my dynamics defined here. So here, theta, remember that is a vector that contains all. Uh, uh, yeah, it contains all the WJ. And so this dynamics gives me a dynamics in the space of probability measure over R to the D plus one. Yes. All the parts is no, nothing is visible. Okay. Uh, I will try to uh, to keep in mind there that I have to write bigger. Otherwise, there are also a few uh, tits, but not so many in the front. Okay. So, is there a part uh, you would like me to clarify specifically, or everything was unclear so far? Okay, I will continue based on uh, that and try to to write uh, bigger. Um, so we have this uh, dynamics in the space of quality measures. We can also parameterize our predictor H by a priority measure. See, here this corresponds to an empirical sum, but I can also define H mu of X to be the integral of pi of W x in mu of w for mu a probability measure in r to the d plus one and in turn so you will remark that when i replace mu by this empirical distribution i have a sum of m function phi and this is exactly a finite width neural network of uh, size M. Okay, so if I replace mu by this mu hat. And in turn, we can define F of mu, a functional over the space of quality measures, which will be this empirical risk uh, evaluated at H mu. Okay. Yeah. I should write bigger because that's a bit. Uh... Okay, so we have reformulated the problem. Uh, so we can parameterize the predictor via probability measure. And in turn, we can define an objective function over the space of probability measures by simply defining our, our hat. So our hat, remember, this is this uh, empirical risk, which I can parameterize uh, by a measure. So here, We have done is that f is a function from the probability measures on r to the d plus one to r which turns out to be convex why is it convex because here this h of new is linear in new 
And then I compose it with a convex function or hat. Or hat is convex because this is our assumption that the loss is convex in the second argument. So now we have a functional which is convex in the space of IoT measure. And when, why do we lose convexity in this case? To come back to the, an earlier question, uh, when we parameterize by uh, our, the positions of the atoms, is that phi is nonlinear in the uh, input weight BJ. So when we do this parameterization uh, with particles, so H will be nonlinear in the parameters BJ. And when we compose a nonlinear function with a convex function, there's absolutely no guarantee that it's convex in general, it won't be. So here we have a convex functional over space of weighting measures. And we would like to write these dynamics in terms of the probability measures only, okay? So uh, to do that, I will, um, we want to have some, something more explicit about what is this gradient of FM. Um, this discretized functional, and you can just apply the chain rule here. So we have that M, M the gradient in theta of FM of theta is given by one over M sum of, or J equals one to uh, N, sorry, I equals one to N of L prime Y I H of theta. So here I can directly write new hat. So H index new hat of T X I. And then by the chain rule, I have also the derivative inside that will come up, the derivative in theta. So there will be gradient in W of phi. Wj uh, xi, and here what I wrote is the gradient, the partial gradient of fm in the vector, in the parameter wj. We hear the index, possibly not visible in the back, it's wj. I have computed the gradient of fm, and here you see why I have put this factor uh, uh, m in uh, the dynamics, because when M goes to, uh, I mean, when M varies or M goes to plus infinity, the size of this gradient will remain the same. While if I did not multiply by M, I would have a, a gradient which vanishes. Another comment on the scaling, which was uh, related to the question that was asked, is here, we have chosen one over M, but other choices are possible. So I will not really discuss in detail this scaling. This will be, in fact, the topic of Greg Young's lecture in the uh, end of the week. So here, this is the good scaling that leads to a, a rich dynamics when M goes to plus infinity. There are other scalings which are possible. I could have chosen one other slow with M. And here, I would have convergence thanks to uh, central limit type uh, theorems. But this leads to very different type of dynamics. And Greg will discuss that a lot uh, in his lectures. And we'll extend this kind of idea. So what are the good choices of learning rates or like step sizes and scalings here or deeper neural networks. We hear what we are seeing is what we're gonna talk about, but only in the case of one, uh, one layer, one hidden layer neural networks. Yeah. So in the capital one part, this, I mean, here I, I was just presenting the general problem we'll consider. And here, what I'm showing is that this, in fact, falls into this general uh, class of problems. Yeah, it is, yeah. The argument is that H mu is, con is linear in mu. And then I compose, to get F, I compose H mu with R hat. R hat is convex functional. So here I compose a linear function with a convex function and I get, um, yes? Here, so there, uh, there is a literature that claims that uh, the noise of stochastic gradient descent is related to adding noise of this form. I'm not taking a stance on that. Uh, it's generally wrong. In some cases, this can be a good approximation. But here, I'm just adding the noise to make it simpler. Uh, and here, this is a, a noiseless gradient. But there are countless of variations uh, we could make. We could take uh, stochastic gradient uh, 
and not adding noise, we could, uh, I mean, here the noise, you can take two equal to zero or larger than zero. What I'm gonna say in this hour, uh, this won't change. Um, so I'm not done right let, uh, in the reformulation. So I want a dynamics which is closed in terms of the quality measure mu. So here we have to remark that this, this looks in fact like uh, the gradient of some function V of new hat evaluated at W, where I need to define what is this V of new hat T. So V of new hat T, this is equal to the function one over N sum for I equals one to N of L prime, Y I uh, H of new at T times phi of WJ uh, XI. So here this is definition of V evaluated at WJ. What is V? V mu is in general a function uh, which is, let's say phi is continuous. I mean, V is a function from RD plus one to R which I've defined here. In fact, V can be seen as the differential of F if I, uh, if I compute the differential of this functional in uh, the space of uh, measures. So this is the Frechet differential of F. But if you're uncomfortable with that, you can just notice that I recognize that when I take the gradient of this function here and I evaluate it at W, I get the gradient. I get this expression. And here, this is the differential of F. And now uh, I have all the tools to rewrite dynamics purely in terms of the measure. Uh, so the dynamics now is, I will just rewrite this by using my reformulation here. W J prime at time T. I will write the dynamics for each particle. It's given by minus the gradient of V of new hat T evaluated at W J of T plus the part which is noise square root of two to D B J of T. So I have one Brownian noise per uh, particle W J. So you can interpret each W J as one particle. And here I have M particles, which evolve, and they are uh, related and correlated via the fact that this function V depends in new hat, which is this empirical distribution. So new hat of T is one over M, the sum for J equals one to M of uh, the delta at WJ at MT. So this is a reformulation in the space of quality measures. You see that you have particles that follow the gradient at each time of a potential. V, we can call it a potential. Sometimes it's called the mean potential, plus some noise if we want to have tone on zero. And this potential depends on time via the empirical distribution of the particles themselves. Okay. How much time? 16 minutes. So now what we, uh, we will do is to understand whether when M goes to plus infinity, there is a well-defined limit to this dynamics. This tells us that when I train a neural network of size M, in fact, I'm approximating some limit dynamics, which I'm discretizing with M particles, which corresponds to training an infinite width neural network. And this remark, so I, I uh, instantiate it with neural networks, but this is a general case when you have such algorithms for probability measures based on particles. So let us first write what is the expected mean field limit. So this limit M goes to plus infinity. This is called the mean field limit. So this is when number of particles tends to plus infinity. But we first define the dynamics that we expect to have in the limit. So W 
will be a function from R plus, so the time axis, to R D plus one, and can be seen as a random path. And it describes the, the, the path taken by an arbitrarily sampled particle in my uh, neural network. And in the limit, we expect it to satisfy the following system. So W um, DW at time t given by minus the gradient of V evaluated as some uh, measure mu t, which I will define after of W at time t plus the noise square root of two to dBt. Here, this is a new Brunel motion, not the same as here. And uh, mu t is the low of W at time t. And uh, I need to mention the initialization that W at time zero is distributed according to our distribution mu zero, which is the same as the initialization we have for the algorithm. So this is the system that we want to show we recover in the limit. This is a so-called mckinney vlasov equation, for those who have already seen uh, this name. So there is an existence and uniqueness theory, which I will not uh, discuss today, uh, to show that there exists a solution to this problem. So the difficult part is that you have a stochastic process where the drift depends on so the drift. This is the, sorry, I missed some dt here. The drift, this is how much this uh, particle uh, moves if I remove the noise at time t. This drift depends itself on the law of the stochastic process. So that makes it a non-inner uh, evolution. Uh, and this is what we want to show is recovered in the limit. So I will stick to a very simple mean field statement. I will make all the best assumptions. And my goal is not to present the state of the art results, but just to convey you the idea of how this kind of results work. Yes? Vision also show that uh, whatever the solution to this like minimizes uh, the function f. That will be my goal later. Okay. It will take uh, some time, yeah. But uh, yeah, it, as a spoiler, in the noisy case, we can show uh, under some hypothesis, I will discuss that we converge globally to a minimizer of f. In the noisy case, we have results of this form as well, but under more structures, which I will discuss. Yes? Yeah, so ah, the, this one, this is just a fresh uh, new brain motion. In the proof, you will see I will make a coupling, but uh, I think this will be clearer after. Let me, uh, how can I make an optimal use of the blackboard? I want to prove this result. I go this way. So I will start the proof here and let's see how it goes. Um, no, it stayed the theorem. I need the theorem to be close to the truth. I will rewrite here. <clears throat> okay, so the statement I want to prove. You can for instance, see if you want, uh, if you're curious and want more details or more complete statement, you have results of this form in, uh, in uh, May, Montanari, uh, Mizia, Kievich, So it's a, it's a classical mean field result, so you can, the literature comes back to the 70s, but written in the context of neural networks. Uh, you can take a look at this paper. And uh, I will state a simple version. So assume, you remember the assumptions. That phi, uh, phi, and the loss 
or bonded with uh, phase differentiable C2 uh, or bonded, okay, with bonded different derivatives. With bonded derivatives up to order two. So these are too strong to cover the case I wrote of neural networks. Uh, but we can discuss that if you're interested, how much we can actually cover this case. Uh, there are some results, but they are harder to prove. Um, then, if I fix a time horizon capital T, there exists. Constant ct larger than zero, so this will be uh, something that I will use in my bound such that f of new uh, t minus f of new hat of t. The supremum over 40 in zero capital T is smaller than uh, one over square root of M. So since I want to state a high probability statement, I will put with probability one minus delta. So I chose the failure probability delta and essentially the uh, difference between the objective function of my limit dynamics and the one I have with M particles is of order one over square root of M. So here, if I'm only tracking the dependence in M, this is very good. Even if it's independent of the dimension, uh, we have CT, it's a constant that depends on time. In general, this is exponentially increasing in time. Uh, there are some recent results where we can in the settings with noise, uh, have in fact a city uniform in time. But this is a recent development I will not discuss. Here, I want to focus on the scaling in M. So you have seven minutes. I think I can give an idea of proof. So the fact that we have a good scaling in M essentially it stems from the fact that phi here is a continuous function. But let's see um, some arguments. So to prove this result, we defined another, another uh, intermediate dynamics. Which I will call new bar of T, which is an empiric like uh, dynamics, which is a uh, discrete measure that evolves in times with the atoms position at W bar and the evolution equation followed by this W bar will be somehow intermediate between the discrete and the mean field equations. And it's as follows. So at initialization, W bar is exactly the same. I forgot to not write at the top. So I will read what I'm writing. So at initialization, the initialization of W bar is exactly the same as the one of my uh, particle dynamics. So here that's, I have a, a random coupling between the two dynamics. And then W bar will evolve as follows. At time t, its evolution will be minus the gradient of V nu t at W bar of t dt plus square root of 2 to db uh, j of t. Sorry, I need to correct my indices. So the j particle has a dynamics which is very similar to the one we have for the uh, 
particle dynamics, the one we have implemented, the only difference is that the mean potential, instead of being evaluated at this empirical distribution of the M particles, V of new hat, it is evaluated at nu t, which is the uh, potential of the limiting dynamics. Okay, so this is really an intermediate, and you can uh, understand it as follows. So I have, let's say, my mean field limit, which is initialized with some new zero, a probability distribution, which may be absolutely continuous. And then I have new t, its evolution in time. In fact, this uh, w bar at time zero, these are independent samples from new zero because this is the same initialization of my particle as my particle dynamics. And then it follows according to this equation. You can see that since, since this equation is uh, linear in the WJ, in the law of the WJs, at all time, this W bar will be IID samples from my uh, limit dynamics. In fact, if you want to write IID samples from this dynamics, you would exactly write like that. Okay, so I have IID samples, and at time t, I have my W bar t. And now the uh, actual dynamics that we can implement with our particles, it is coupled in the sense that it follows the same initialization. So each particle will start from the same position, and the noise also is the same. So this Brownian motion is the same as the one I have here. But the only difference is the difference in the drift. So the particle WJ at MT, we can only ex expect them to diverge only slightly, at least follow some Grandval uh, argument uh, from the, uh, the W bar. So the proof of this result then is simply to formalize this idea. Uh, Let me see what I can do in two minutes. Yeah, I will, I will uh, not have time to uh, detail the proof, but you can see uh, the idea. So the idea of proof is that you define H of T, which is the average distance between these pairs of particles, so this distance between WJ at MT and WJ bar at MT, or so, uh, J equals one to M. And then we have to prove using the fact that W bar are made of IID samples from the limit measure, we can use some concentration results and prove that H prime of T is smaller or equal or equal than a constant times H of T plus, that's where this concentration comes up. So here I do not write the details of how we obtain such a control, but once you have this, you can infer that since H prime is a subsolution of this OD and H at time zero is zero, thanks to this coupling, we have that H of T is smaller than this, uh, the same bound that we have in the theorem, CT square root of log one over delta over square root of M. And then we can convert this control on H on the control on the difference between uh, the functional value at mu t and at mu, mu hat of t, uh, you get uh, using similar uh, concentration result. So here, I did not have the time to cover the details of this proof, but everything is in uh, this picture somehow, and also using the fact that we have uh, IID samples uh, by, of mu t by W bar. Uh, okay. So uh, there's one last thing I want to do before the next lecture, which is to write in a PDE form this uh, nonlinear, like this 
stochastic differential equation, this Mackin Blazov system. I will write it in a PDE form, which will be useful then to prove global convergence results in the mean field limit. So, PDE formulation. We have that ut for the law of this limit system, the mean field limit, satisfies uh, in the weak sense the following partial differential equation. So the evolution in time of nutty is given by. So here I will take into account the drift term. And when I write it in PDE form, this is what we get. So we have the divergence operator of mu t grad of new uh, v mu t. So here this just shows that the density of mu t is advected by a velocity field given at the gradient of v of mu t, which is the first part of this SDE. And then I have the Brownian noise, which, uh, as usual, it induces a Laplacian diffusion. So here, this is the Laplacian of mu t. So that's the equation uh, that we get in the limit. And then we, uh, in the next lecture, we'll start from the, there to prove that uh, when we have some noise, we can have global convergence of mu t to the global minimizer of capital. I will stop here to uh, meet the rest of time. And maybe if you have questions or final questions, I can answer them. There are several, there is no simple summarizing results for the global convergence. What we will see tomorrow is that when there is noise and under some um, coercivity assumption, which I will define, we have global convergence. Uh, so this is a, a recent result that we have obtained uh, last year. Uh, if you have no noise, then you need some further assumption on V or on phi in the case of neural networks. To have global convergence. And in that case, we can have some results, but they are only partial and non quantitative. I will discuss that uh, in the following lecture. So there's no one single result. In general, there is no, I mean, there's no way to expect this converges to the global minimizer because we are in a, so although F is convex, the dynamics we are following is not following, um, is not according to a geometry under which F is convex. So we cannot directly use convexity of F to infer that we converge globally. In fact, in general, we know that this is a hard problem. Any optimization problem can be cast as a convex optimization over the space of measures. Maybe something I should mention just to emphasize on the difficulty of the task. If you want to minimize F of X for X on uh, some variety or some, uh, oh, sorry, a Riemannian manifold uh, capital uh, X. This is equivalent to minimizing the integral of F of X in mu of X for mu a priority measure over X. And the uh, minimizer here will be a delta direct mass at the minimizer of F. And here, this is the simplest case where we have a linear functional, not even complex. So in general, we cannot, we cannot expect uh, efficient algorithms, but uh, my goal will be to describe some situations where things work well, even in the nonlinear case when we have a convex function instead of a linear. So for two layer neural networks, um, there is indeed many solutions when we look at this formulation, but many, uh, uh, like a large part of the redundancy can be killed by uh, taking into account, like quotienting this invariance by uh, permutations. There are other notions of invariance that we can kill, for instance, in a real neural network, the input and output weights can be exchanged, like uh, 
Uh, and there are some very specific settings where if we quotient out all these uh, invariances, we can have uniqueness, but this is not a typical case. I would say like one example is when you have the um, absolute value nonlinearity and the signal you try, try to learn is given by a teacher neural network with the same structure and you have uh, uh, Gaussian inputs and you minimize the population risk. So like there are several, many, many solutions, uh, many uh, assumptions in certain settings, we can prove there's uniqueness of the minimizers. Otherwise, we can only hope to converge to one of the minimizers. And there's a whole no, uh, line of research, which is which one did we converge to when we did this algorithm? So this I, I did not plan to talk about in these lectures, but we can in some settings characterize it. Um, yeah. And, but when I will add noise, so the next step in these lectures, we'll add in fact an entropic regularization to the objective. And then since it's strictly convex, uh, we'll have a unique minimizer, which somehow gives mass equally to all the possible minimizers. Uh, 